Hey everyone, I had to make a video about this and I'm sorry that I won't be able to edit it. It's going to be an unscripted rant and I don't have much of a choice because I don't have any time, but I needed to throw out there my initial thoughts on Windows 11 before I ran off and did stuff this weekend and was too busy to say something and post it. Do you see this mug? What does this mug say right here? It says, there is no cloud, it's just someone else's computer. I love this mug, but the mug is not what we're talking about. We're talking about someone else's computer. So, Windows 11 has a couple of requirements that I find horrifically problematic. Number one, it doesn't support old-style BIOSes. It only supports UEFI. Now, that may not seem like a humongous problem, but recall that UEFI on PCs has only really been there in a bootable form for consumers since Windows 8. And Windows 8 came out in 2012. Yes, that's nine years ago. I'm still refurbishing computers that are 13 years old. There are a whole swath of older computers that will be cut off by this, but that's not the thing that gives me the most concern. <clears throat> by the way, I talk slowly. Feel free to speed the video up. The thing that bothers me is the requirement for Secure Boot to be turned on to use the system at all, the trusted platform module being required to use the system at all. So it's not a matter of simply, oh, Secure Boot's off, we'll throw a warning like Windows 8 used to, and they uh, took that away in Windows 10. They actually stopped warning you about that. <clears throat> I wonder why. Well, because it was annoying, and some of us boot with Secure Boot off on purpose. Now here's the thing. What does Secure Boot do? Secure Boot, ostensibly, for a normal human being, it has pretty good intentions. Secure Boot makes it so that if your system has some kind of a hack, if something gets into your system and manages to put itself into early boot, the part of the system where when your computer's built-in code, the firmware, the BIOS, whatever you want to call it, the code that runs before any operating system ever does, the thing that shows you the manufacturer logo and press this to get into setup, that kind of thing. That loads the bootloader and the bootloader loads the operating system. Secure Boot requires that the bootloader be signed with a security key. And that security key, guess what? It has to be part of this, this firmware. PCs by default ship with the firmware with the security keys for Microsoft Windows and no other system. <clears throat> Sorry about the cough. They don't come with support to boot anything other than Microsoft Windows on a PC. Now, okay, yes, let's be practical. For the vast majority of people, that in and of itself doesn't matter. But the reason that it really is largely a non-issue today is that if you want to run Linux... You can just turn Secure Boot off, or most systems have provisions by which you can boot Linux with Secure Boot off and then inject the keys, or whatever. There are ways to get Linux working with Secure Boot because Microsoft signed a Linux bootloader with some kind of secondary key. So, the bottom line is, Linux users have to ask Microsoft for permission to run Linux on their own computers. That is the state we're in today, but you can change that on the vast majority of computers. Secure Boot can be turned off, and in fact, when Microsoft started to require for Windows 8 certification that Secure Boot be available and on by default, part of the requirement was also that it must be possible to turn it off. And that's great. That is what we want. <clears throat> Anybody who wants to run Linux, and you wants to run anything other than Windows, and there are a surprising number of things that run alternatively to Windows that aren't just Linux. You have BSD distributions, but more importantly, there are a lot of tools that are used in diagnostics. I run a PC repair shop. I use such tools. For example, there's a tool called Memtest86 that I use to test RAM. Memtest86, guess what? It's not Windows, and I don't know if it's signed or not because I don't care, because I don't have to care, but Memtest86 should not have to request that Microsoft sign every single binary they build for me. But more than that, open source and free software, software made by small people, shouldn't have to be signed by Microsoft to be able to run on the computer that you own. 
But let's go a step further. Secure Boot is one thing. The TPM, the Trusted Platform Module, well, that's the thing that is used to store security keys, store security information. For example, if you have a TPM, Windows 10's Credential Storage Manager will store your credentials in the TPM rather than storing those credentials directly on the disk somewhere with an encryption key tied to your Windows login password in both cases, I believe. But the TPM, what happens is if you boot an operating system and that operating system is not the same operating system as the one that you are booting with the TPM security keys. It won't hand the keys over for the one operating system if you boot the other operating system. Now, this sounds like a bunch of garble, like blah, 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 blah. What are you talking about, Mr. Computer Man? You're talking about the computer jargon and they're not saying anything to substance. Well, the TPM stores these keys, and the keys are used by Windows Boot Locker. Boot Locker. <laughs> boot Licker. Um, sorry, it's not Boot Locker, it's Bit Locker. Uh, but Boot Licker is probably a good idea to call it at this point. So, what'll happen on a computer that comes with Windows 10, comes with Secure Boot enabled, comes with a TPM, newer ones, they will have Boot Locker, Bit Locker, God Almighty, Bit Locker, I, I might as well be called Boot Locker. They will have BitLocker turned on by default, which encrypts your hard drive, which means that now the contents of your hard drive are scrambled so that you can't boot Linux to recover data from that partition or whatever, because it's encrypted. And where's the encryption key stored, you might ask? In the trusted platform module. And what happens if anything goes wrong with that hardware? Oh, that's right, you lose everything on your hard drive. Now, yes, I know that if you know what you're doing, you can set up a BitLocker recovery flash drive. There are other ways that you can get this recovery thing going, store a backup copy of the key somewhere. Microsoft likes to shovel a backup copy of your key to guess where. Your Microsoft account that they force you to log into or create with newer Windows 10 editions if you get a new computer, turn it on, and actually connect it to the Internet. So yeah, Microsoft wants to control what you can do with your computer. They want to force you to authenticate to them to use your computer. They want to lock all of the data that is on your computer and store the key on their computers. One of these bad boys. On their computers. In any case, you are a slave to Microsoft. You must ask Microsoft for permission to do everything. The computer is no longer yours. Now here's the thing. <clears throat> Why is it called a trusted platform module? Why isn't it called something else? Well, trusted platform modules emerged from the move towards what they called trusted computing. There is a rant, a very old one by Richard Stallman of the Free Software Foundation back when this was a big deal like 10 years ago where they explain the whole trusted computing concept in terms that I'm trying to re-explain here. But basically, what the trust thing is, is it's a bit of a misunderstanding. So, I have a computer, and it has this trusted computing platform, that, which the TPM basically makes real, and that plus secure boot. <clears throat> what I think is that I have trust in my computer. I can trust that my bootloader hasn't been hijacked. I can trust that my security keys are protected from someone stealing my computer and just being able to yank them out of the TPM wholesale without my password, my fingerprint, whatever. And to some extent that's true. But the other side of it is more nefarious and is far more dangerous and is the reason that I'm making this video today. Trusted computing doesn't really mean that you can trust your computer. Trusted computing means that Microsoft and other large manufacturers of software and manufacturers of hardware by extension can trust your computer to do what they want it to do. It means that the computer can be trusted against the end user, the person who actually paid for it and owns it, not that the computer can be trusted by the user. This is the distinction that must be made. This is the important part of this. This is what nobody else is talking about. Secure Boot and the Trusted Platform Module being required, they must both be on and functional, means that you can't use your computer anymore. Microsoft owns the keys to your kingdom. Microsoft holds all the cards. Microsoft can trust your computer against you. 
This is especially true when it comes to things like free software. Remember Windows 10 and S mode? I made a video about how crappy it is. They were trying to get you to only run software <clears throat> that was pulled from the Windows Store, which Microsoft has monopoly control of and oversees and makes all decisions regarding what can go there. That's not how these computers are supposed to work. You're supposed to be able to run what you want on your computer. But you've accepted this for years, just not with your computer. You've accepted it with your phones, your mobile devices, your tablets. Mm. I'm sorry, I'm just having, I need more coffee, don't I? You've accepted this with all of your mobile devices because guess what? If you have an iPhone and some small developer would like to make an application and put it out there and not have to go through Apple's process and not bow to Apple's demands and not be a slave to Apple and what Apple wants, guess what? They can't. Do you know why they can't? Because to get an app on the Apple App Store, you have to go through Apple's processes. So if you want to release your software on a website and have someone download it, install it, and enjoy it without Apple getting in your way, you can't do it. So, you, end user, clearly do not care that much about making your own app so much as being able to run them. Well, it kills you too because you don't have free choice. You can only run on your phone what Apple chooses to put on your phone. When Apple decided to ban Tumblr from the App Store, guess what? They didn't just ban Tumblr, they deleted it from everyone's phones that already had downloaded and set it up. So they didn't just ban it, they were able to retroactively claw back apps that users had put on their hardware, their property, that they own. They were able to take that back off without permission, without notice, against the user's desires effectively destroying Tumblr. Eh, Tumblr is a shell of what it once was. Now it was never great, but whatever. We, won't, we don't talk about Tumblr right now. The point is that you don't control your own hardware when it comes to your mobile devices anymore. If you have an Amazon device, if you have an Apple device, if you have some Android devices, you can't do that. They have made it difficult even on Android to do what's called side-loading apps, which used to just be called downloading them but they call it sideloading because you're bypassing the official, controlled, corporate money-backed and controlled application store, Google, Apple, Amazon, take your pick. You're bypassing that and doing what you want to do with your property. You can't do that anymore. Apple's computers have also been moving in this direction. The T2 security chip, yep, same thing except on Apple. Apple's had UEFI for a long time, but with the move to Max Apple Silicon stuff, the M1 chip and all that, yeah, it, it's lockdown time, baby. You can't even run Linux on that. You have to run Mac OS. You can't run Linux. You can't run Windows. You used to be able to run Windows. Now you can't even run Windows on a Mac. And maybe at some point in the future, they'll let you run Windows for ARM on the Mac Apple Silicon. But who knows? The bottom line is that this makes your computer the same as your mobile phone. Now, granted, if you're just a normie, if you're just an end user that doesn't really care about all this stuff, you just want to be able to run Word and Teams and Outlook and crap, maybe it doesn't affect you directly yet, but it does affect you. It's already affected you in your mobile devices because you do not have access to certain things because these big corporate gatekeepers have decided that you can't do what you want. There's also, and we're gonna dig in here, there's also the matter of piracy. See, this is probably one of the big things that they're trying to stop. But there are actually several legitimate reasons to engage in piracy and crack software. One of those reasons is software activation, which I meant to make a bigger video on, but I'll touch on it here. I am of the opinion, the very strong opinion, that software which requires any form of internet activation, phone activation, software you can't just install and go, software that you buy, but then you have to activate, or software that is rental software, such as things are moving now, Adobe Creative Cloud, you can't own it anymore, you can only rent it. I am of the belief that that is extremely immoral, unethical, Take your pick. It's bad. Why is it bad? Because if you make a portfolio in Adobe Illustrator or InDesign, just as an example, 
You make a portfolio, you're an artist, you're a designer, you're an architect, and you make a portfolio in a proprietary piece of software, an industry standard piece of software, that you are not allowed to buy, that you have to rent on a monthly basis. You hit financial hard times, you have a portfolio made in InDesign, you need to make some tweaks to your portfolio while you're job searching, money's getting real tight, and you can't afford that $55 a month for the Creative Cloud subscription. What do you do? If your subscription lapses, you lose all access to the software that your stuff is in. You do not own your data if you do not own your software. And by extension, you do not own your software if you do not own and control the hardware it runs on top of. This is part of a long process. I have been doing computer stuff for my entire life. I have programmed on computers from the late 70s all the way up to today. I started on a Commodore 64. I have read all about the Homebrew Computer Club, the beginnings of Apple, the beginnings of all these computer companies that competed against IBM and the mainframe makers. And this has been a slow creep for decades. Users are very slowly losing the rights to their property, their hardware, their software, and by extension because of that, everything that they do on their computer. Notice how everything tries to get stored in a cloud somewhere. Everything is trying to take away your control and lock you into someone else's hardware, software, and most importantly control being taken away from you, being put in their hands, they're trying to take away your autonomy, your self-ownership, your rights to control your life, your hardware, your software, the stuff that you pay for. You paid for it. It's yours. Except it's not. Because they're doing this end run around your rights, your property rights, the stuff that you own, the stuff that you pay for, the stuff that you exchange a portion of your life to be able to obtain and keep. They're taking it away from you. Windows 11 is this. Now, Macs have been going this way for a long time. Mobile devices are already there. But with Windows 11's requirements, you will see within the next 10 years total lockdown PCs. You will see computers that the user is not able to put anything other than Windows on. You will see this happen. I promise. I guarantee it. It is a matter of time. They're boiling the frog in the pan. If you don't know what that means, go look it up. That's what's happening. That's why Windows 11 is a freaking disaster, and you need to do whatever you can to make sure that Microsoft knows you won't put up with it. You won't take it. Windows 11 needs to be resisted at every possible turn. It is the behemoth that will swallow computing freedom for all of us. And that's my unscripted rant on Windows 11. Uh, I haven't even gotten into the other stuff, but you know what? Like, comment, subscribe, and all that. But I do also want to announce that at some point in the future, I have been working on the underpinnings of a video about how user interfaces have also gone on a decline for a while now, especially in the past 10 years, but more so just over time, user interfaces improved and then got worse. I'm planning a documentary on that. If you want to be notified when that comes out, do the whole bell icon down there on YouTube, uh, or whatever, wherever this video ends up, subscribe and all that. Um, if you want to give me money so I can focus on something other than doing just computer repair all the time, there's support links down below. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day. Screw Windows 11. Boy, I can't stand this. My blood is boiling. And always remember, the cloud is just someone else's computer. Have a good one.